So I, I really appreciate my pastor has been so kind, so generous to me. I just a few days ago talked to a pastor. He founded a wonderful church 50 years ago, and he is now not allowed to walk on the property. And pastor, how I was thinking about it. He lets me be the grandfather. I get to come and give hugs, but I never have to give spankings. <laughs> it's wonderful. I want to talk to you about how to avoid killing your family during the quarantine. How to avoid killing your family during the quarantine. Philippians chapter 2 verse 1. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ. The word consolation is the word for, the, for paraclete, for the Holy Spirit used in John chapter 14. Uh, if there be any comfort of love. If there be any fellowship of the Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit. If there be any bowels and mercies, the word there is the strongest word for compassion in the Bible. It, it, it's the strongest word for compassion in the Greek language. It's what's used of the Lord Jesus in Matthew chapter 9 when he was moved with compassion. Now, do we have comfort from the Lord? Do we have love from Him? Are we able to be indwelt with the Spirit? Uh, do we have compassion that's been showed upon us? Well, the answer, of course, is yes. So if there are those things, Paul says, moved by the Spirit of God, fulfill you my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Father, would you guide me as I speak? Thanks for the great privilege. Thanks for the wonderful things you're doing through our church. Thank you for the vision of our pastor and so many good things that are happening even in this difficult time. And help me to be a help to all those who are listening or will maybe look at this at a later time. And we'll thank you for what you do in Jesus' name. Amen. I didn't know who she was, but I looked this up. Kelly Ripa from the show Kelly and Ryan used to be with Regis and somebody else. It makes $22 million a year. Her net worth is $120 million. And she cried on air the other day because the quarantine has been so tough. She says that none of her three children will hug her and two of them won't speak to her. Some troubles. Uh, divorce lawyers in New York City are getting a record number of calls asking for their assistance in dissolving marriages. When the quarantine ended in China, they had record numbers of divorces. In Tennessee, in a recent week, more people died because of suicide than because of the COVID crisis, the virus. In fact, more people died just in one county, Knox County, than died in the whole state, one county for suicide, than the whole state because of the coronavirus, the Chinese virus, COVID-19, whatever you want to call it. Uh, there are some issues. Somebody told me they asked the Bridgeport State Poli or the Bridgeport Police, uh, are you uh, kind of taking it easy these days with everybody being off the street. Oh no, they were told domestic violence is at an all-time high. So maybe a timely topic for us to talk about. It was really important to the Apostle Paul that the church at Philippi, a great church, a church that he loved, that that church would have love and unity and a good spirit. He said to them in, in chapter 1 and verse 9, I want your love to abound more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. He said in verse 27 of chapter 1, let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs that ye stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith. He said in chapter 2 and verse 14, do all things without murmurings or disputings. And in chapter 20, he said, I have no man, chapter 2 and verse 20, I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. He said in chapter 3 and verse 16, uh, Nevertheless, where until we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. And in chapter 4 and verse 2, he said, I beseech Eodius and beseech Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. It was a big deal to him. This was a great church, one of the best churches to whom Paul, the Apostle Paul wrote an epistle and moved by the Spirit of God to put those words on paper. And yet he was very concerned that they get along. I've read this verse, I've quoted this verse, but I've never really studied it in depth. And I want you to see three things as we look at the second, the third verse of Philippians chapter 2. Number one, I want you to notice there is a motivation to avoid. 
A motivation to avoid. Let nothing. How many things? Nothing be done by strife or vain glory. To have strife means to have a partisan spirit. I looked up the word. One of the definitions is electioneering. It's a word that's used to divide into political parties, into political factions. Uh, uh, it, It is the idea of wanting the best chair to watch the TV program. Wanting the last piece of pie. Wanting to not be disturbed when you're taking a nap. Wanting to have your choice of the TV program. After all, what possible uh, person would choose a Hallmark movie over an ESPN rerun? Which project to work on? Not a partisan spirit. Not wanting to have your way. Uh, So the motivation to avoid, don't be partisan. Don't have a partisan spirit. Number two, don't have a prideful spirit. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. That just means empty pride. It means groundless self-esteem. Now, the Bible does not tell us to hate ourselves. The Bible says, let no man think more highly of himself than he ought to think. Uh, supposing that I said to Brother Colin, you are a wonderful cook. And he said, oh, no, Brother that I'm not near as good a cook as you are. Well, that's nonsense. I know how to make one thing well, grilled cheese. I discovered a method on our little grill on the stove by buttering the grill instead of the bread and putting a lot of real butter on there and letting the bread get warm and then melting the cheese a little bit on the grill and putting it on the bread. I made a great grilled cheese sandwich. It was my specialty. Now, my wife says it made the house smell a little bit because of that butter on there. And then she brought out the George Foreman grill and all of my expertise has gone by the wayside. But Brother Cowling wouldn't be being prideful if he said he's a better cook than me. And he wouldn't be being humble if he said that I'm a better cook than him. He'd be a hypocrite if he said that. The Bible doesn't say to hate yourself, but it does say not to have empty pride, not to have vain glory, not to have groundless self-esteem. I have observed that the people who have the most pride, who demonstrate the most pride, usually have the most grounds for humility. They don't demonstrate it, but they do. A motivation to avoid. Nothing partisan, nothing prideful. And then a mindset to accept. Here's the second thing that the Bible tells us. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. That's the motivation to avoid. But in lowliness of mind. That's the mindset that we must adopt. In lowliness of mind. That means to have a humble opinion of one's self. Years ago, I was watching a TV program called The Phil Donahue Show. Donahue was a liberal, and he was kind of one of the first talk show guys. And he had a man on named Stanton Samino. Stanton Samino was a clinical psychologist. He had written a book called Inside the Criminal Mind. And it was intriguing. This was about 20 years ago, maybe more than that. And Samino said that, that criminals had higher self-esteem than the rest of society. They weren't suffering from low self-esteem. It wasn't that nobody bought them a wagon when they were a little boy or somebody else got a bigger present at the party. They actually thought they were better than everybody else. That's why they thought they deserved your stuff. And they would steal it. So the motivation to avoid a partisan spirit, a prideful spirit, the mindset to adopt in lowliness of mind. Our daughter, Carissa, was five before our daughter Katie was born. It's hard to teach an only child to share. And our nieces, Katrina and Christina, were going to come over and we'd practice with Carissa. And we'd say, now if the twins come and they want to play with the toy you got, you want to share with them? And, and we'd pretend, I'm Katrina, I want that doll. And Carissa was so good. She smiled, a beautiful smile. And she handed it over and she said, you can have it. We practiced and she did so well in practice. Then the twins came over, and we were in the other room playing Rook, and we heard from the bedroom, No! It's mine! You can't have it! Yeah. Lowliness of mind. A mindset to adopt, not to think that I'm higher or more deserving than others. Uh, Strife comes when we think we deserve more than we have. Unity comes when we realize that we have more than we deserve. 
And so my mind said, lowliness of mind, not lifting myself up, putting myself under the other person. The word submit literally means to rank under. And that brings me to the third truth from this passage. Not only is there a motivation to avoid, a mindset to adopt, lowliness of mind, but there is a measurement to apply. Look what it says. Let each esteem other better than themselves. I'm going to say it again. You fill in the word where I pause. Let each esteem other better than themselves. The word esteem means to consider. It means to account. The word better means to be above in rank. I had a wonderful opportunity for a long time to pastor this church. And we had some special speakers in. And uh, I was traveling and preaching some in the early days, not as much as I did later on. And I noticed something, that the special speakers we had in here sometimes had a very long list. I'm not exaggerating, pages and pages of things for us to do when they came. Uh, They needed an office. They needed a telephone. They needed certain meals at certain times. They needed certain amounts of money for this and that. And we did all the things they wanted. And... uh, I remember calling back from a meeting in another state and speaking to one of our assistant pastors and they were telling me all the things this person wanted and we did everything on the list. And then they called and they wanted some other things. And I I said, you know, when I go out to preach, I do whatever the preacher wants. When I'm home and I have a special speaker in, I do whatever they want. When do I get to be in charge? (laughs) Answer, never. God's in charge. And God told me to esteem others better than myself. Last, uh, yesterday, Pastor called and asked me if I would participate. And so I was going to write the lesson. We'd had dinner and I was sitting down at the dining room table. Our house has a great room, the kitchen, the dining room, the living room, all one room. No walls or separation between them. And Chrissy sat down and was going to watch a Hallmark movie. I sat down at the table to start to work on this lesson. And uh, the Hallmark movies are wonderful. I've had some just delightful naps during Hallmark movies. I've read some really good books during Hallmark movies. I've actually enjoyed a few Hallmark movies uh, that my wife has had on. And uh, she said, honey, would you rather me watch this in another room so you can study? I said, well, thank you, sweetheart. That would probably be a little less distracting. And I studied in silence. And she went to another room and watched the Hallmark movie. What was she doing? She was esteeming me better than herself. We have a bay window at our dining room right where the table is. And for a very long time, I've sat at the head of the table. And my wife has sat over here. And we both look out the window. But one day she mentioned that she couldn't see the bird feeder as well from her seat. And uh, she saw more of the pole barn and a little less of the pond out and back. And I said, well, sweetheart, why don't we just switch seats? I like looking at my pole barn. <laughs> Men like to look at pole barns. I like looking at bird feeders a little bit. But, uh, but I'm, I'm not into it as much as she is. She knows the names of all the birds. In fact, I think she may have named all the birds that come by and uh, individually taking care of that. And so we switched seats. But what was I doing? I was esteeming her better than myself. Now, I could have said, I'm the man of this house. I paid the mortgage payments. I paid the utility bills. I'll sit at whatever seat I want. I could have. But I wouldn't have been obeying the Bible. Some of you may have heard me tell this story in a couple's retreat. It epitomizes what the Bible's telling us here. It epitomizes truths that we'll need to get along now and for years to come. There was a lady who had an aunt and an uncle, Uncle Bill and Aunt Teresa. They married late in life and never had children. They had the sweetest relationship, and they were going to come visit. And this lady said, I'm going to find out the secret of their happy marriage, how they've done so well for so long, just the two of them. She knew that every time Aunt Teresa went to the bakery, she bought glazed donuts. And she knew that every time Uncle Bill went to the bakery, he bought cinnamon rolls. And so she ran to the bakery and she got some glazed donuts because that's what Aunt Teresa always bought and some cinnamon rolls because that's what Uncle Bill always bought. And she was ready to ask her question, but that first breakfast she set out the rolls and the donuts and she was intrigued as Uncle Bill, who always bought the cinnamon rolls, reached for a glazed donut. 
And Aunt Teresa, who always bought the glazed donuts, reached out and took a cinnamon roll. You see, whenever they went to the bakery, they didn't get what they preferred. They got what the other person preferred. They each esteemed the other better than themselves. Father in heaven, thank you for these truths from your word. Open our hearts and minds. Help us to avoid the motivations of strife and vainglory. Help us to have the mindset of loneliness and help us to measure others better than ourselves. Now our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. Pastor asked me to do this. You may be listening or watching and not know for sure that you have a home in heaven. Can I talk to you for a minute? God loves you. He loves the world and he doesn't want to be separated from anybody for eternity. He wants you to spend forever with him. But there's a problem. Our sin keeps us from heaven. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God and the wages of sin is death. We couldn't pay for our own sin by joining a church or being good or getting baptized. But the Bible says God took care of that. In that we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God showed us his love by sending his only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to be born of a virgin, God becoming man, to live a perfect life, to bleed and die on the cross, to rise from the grave the third day. And the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, saved from dying and going to hell, saved from their sin. If you don't know that you're on your way to heaven and you'd like to know it, if you believe that Jesus, God's son, bled and died on the cross to pay for your sin, if you realize that you can't pay for your sin yourself, but you'll trust Jesus and him alone to be the payment for your sin, I'm going to invite you to pray a prayer with me. Saying the words doesn't really mean anything, but meaning what the words say will change everything. And I can tell you ahead of time what we'll pray. We'll pray something like this, Lord, I admit I'm a sinner. I don't deserve to go to heaven. I believe you sent your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for my sin. And I trust Jesus and him alone to forgive my sin, to become my savior, and to take me to heaven when I die. Pray that prayer with me. Say it from your heart to God. Would you, Lord, I admit I'm a sinner. Tell him that. He'll hear you. I don't deserve to go to heaven. I believe you sent your son, the Lord Jesus, to die on the cross for my sin. I trust Jesus and him alone to forgive my sin, to become my savior, and to take me to heaven when I die. Close your prayer by saying, thank you for saving me, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Pastor, I would like to send you some information that will help you. If you just send us a, an email at 2fbc.com, the website, you can find a link to the email. Or you want to call the church at 777-0210. We'd be happy to help you with that. Thank you so much, Pastor, for letting me be part of this service tonight.